Hello, everybody, and welcome to Circuit Lab Practice. My name is Mr. Burleson, and we'll be covering all practices for both B and C. I know that we already have Mr. Dazi on, and I don't know if we have any others on, but um, if we've got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat window. Okay, so keep in mind, I created 15 separate practices which cover all of the items. You'll also notice that they're all up to level 15. There are 15 levels of items in the homework generator. The only items I did not create for the homework generator were the, um, was for um, operational amplifiers, okay? And the key thing to keep in mind with an operational amplifier is to make sure that you know the difference between a comparator, a non-inverting amplifier, and an inverting amplifier. You should also know how to do general, simple circuit analysis for an ideal operational amplifier, which means that you understand that the current going into either of the inputs is zero, the input impedance between the two inputs is infinite, basically, that the um, that the gain at the out at the output uh, is is near infinite. And the other thing to keep in mind: the output of a of a, an operational amplifier is the one place where they say never do a KCL. Okay. So, in addition to Mr. Dazi, is there anyone else here? So, so since uh, nobody has responded yet, I'll just go really quickly through uh, practice 12, okay, which is LEDs, diodes, and operational amplifiers. So you'll notice here we've got operational amplifiers, or there, you remember there are different types of switches, your standard normal switch, like a light switch, which is simple on and off. It's either open, which is off, or closed, where it is on. You've got a single pulse double throw, where again, you have a common output here, but you switch between one input or another, okay? Now, what's nice about this is that you can switch from one circuit to a different circuit okay but not two at the same time a double pole single throw is is similar to the single pole single throw but the two throws are actually hooked together such that when i click it here okay they both set up two separate circuits now you'll see this quite often a lot in uh 240 or 220 volt uh, circuits where you'll have 110 volts and 110 volts here as well, okay? And you have a double pole, double throw, where basically, again, your, your throws are linked together and you're switching between multiple circuits. Fuses are safety devices which burn out, so the filament, like right there, will burn out at a given rating. So you'll see like the ratings here. And, and it's the in they're set up for amperage. A circuit breaker is very similar to a fuse, except that it trips. In other words, it switches off automatically when it exceeds the amperage rating. So this is a 32 amp, that's a 20 amp, that's an 8 amp. Um, generally speaking, uh, you see these a lot more now because you don't have to replace them because it just automatically switches off. It's a little bit slower though on the protection, so the protection's not quite as good. So in some of the things, you'll still see fuses. We talked about dependent sources, where a dependent source is shown by a diamond shape and you can have either both a dependent current source and a dependent voltage source. And what it is is that it's some sort of equation usually referencing something else in the uh, diagram, okay? 
You can use KVLs and KCLs on these, but keep in mind when we do superposition, you cannot do superposition with dependent uh, voltage or current sources. Superposition is really useful when you have multiple independent current sources or multiple independent voltage sources or just multiple independent sources. And what you can do is you solve the different, you solve for the current and voltages with just using one of the independent sources at a time. You get rid of all the other sources. If it's a if it's a voltage source you're getting rid of, you replace it with a short. And if it's a current source, you're replacing it with an open. You then solve it for every, like that, for every last. So if you've got three independent sources, you solve it for all three independent sources. And you can add together the currents. You can add together the voltages. Just keep in mind, you cannot add together power. And you cannot use this with dependent sources. We talk about diodes, and a diode is a two-terminal device that looks something like this, and it's got an anode and a cathode, okay? And it generally allows current to flow in one direction. So if I put a positive, usually like a 0.7 volt uh, voltage on here, this actually acts very much like a short, okay? And so if you look at the current versus voltage diagram of a diode, you'll notice that here is at zero volts, so minus one volt, it's, it's acting like it's open, but if I get positive one volt, it's acting like a short. So you can imagine this is a really nice way to make sure that the, that the current only flows in one direction. Now, this is what they call reverse uh, bias voltage here, and you'll notice all the way up to minus 49, up to minus 50 volts, it's acting open. But believe it or not, you can reverse the voltage so much that it breaks down. And then at that point, it actually then opens up. Uh, and you'll notice here's the breakdown voltage. An ideal diode, okay, an ideal diode either acts as an open or it acts as a closed. So you'll notice that the current going through it is either zero or infinite. In other words, it's either gonna be a short or it's gonna be an open. So an ideal diode, think of it as a switch that is either closed or open, okay? Now you can create a real diode from an ideal diode by putting in the forward bias voltage as well as the forward bias resistance. And the forward bias resistance is usually very, very low, usually less than, a, than an ohm. And then the forward bias voltage is gonna be about 0 0.7 volts for most uh, silicon uh, diodes. Light emitting diodes are special type of diodes that when it is in forward bias, <laughs> excuse me, when it's in forward bias, they actually light up. And depending on the type of material you have, they will light up in different colors, okay? Make sure you have lots of different uh, pictures of these because you know, you might be asked, you know, you know, a diagram picture like this. Now, keep in mind, in the homework generator, I put in an LED data sheet tab that looks something like this, okay? And it shows you the different colors that you can have for your diets, okay? Oh, wait, sorry. That's the, uh, that's the rules. Da, 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 da. Sorry. I meant to go back to this, Okay. So for this diode practice, if you get a diode problem like this, the easiest way to solve for it, okay, is to solve pretending you don't know if this diode is turned on or off. You don't know if this diode is turned on or off. So you need to solve for all four potential conditions. So you pretend, well, what if D1 is on and D2 is, or excuse me, if they're both on, what if D1 is off and D2 is on? What if they're both off? And what if D1 is on and D2 is off? Now, here's the thing. You solve both of them. You solve all four of these, and you'll notice that none of these actually worked. Okay? In other words, there wasn't a situation where both of these would be off. There wasn't a situation where 
they would both be on. And there wasn't a situation where this one's off and this one's on. However, there is a situation. It does. The math does work for this one to be off and this one to be on. So this is the way it's working. So this diode here is on and this one is off. Okay. Now, if you want to replace a diode with a real diode, you replace that diode with an ideal diode, whatever the four bias voltage is, and you notice it's in reverse, so it like sucks up some of your voltage, 0 0.7 volts for a, uh, for a, um, a, um, a silicon diode. And then we put a four bias resistance, usually very, very small, like on the order of an ohm or less. And then we replace that with those, with those. And that's how you um, uh, demonstrate a real diode. An, op an operational amplifier, and keep in mind this is for division C only, you have two inputs, the inverting input, the non-inverting input. Then you have a voltage. You have usually a positive and minus voltage. And that usually determines how much gain you could get out of the system. But keep in mind, for ideal operational amplifiers, you assume that this, it's, it can do infinite gain. In reality, believe it or not, you can see like 10,000 times, you know, a... 10,000 times gain. Now, you never ever put a KCL here, okay? But what you'll find is that you can create a lot of different things here with op amps. So this is what an op amp would actually look like with the resistors and the capacitors inside a common 741 op amp. However, in reality, it looks more like this. You'll notice we got a dependent source here, which is your gain. You've got an R out. So this R out is going to be really, really small, like dang near zero. This, this input resistance is going to be really, really high, usually on the order of giga ohms. Okay. And VS and VS minus are usually plus or minus five volts, but they can be even more than that. Okay. Now, for an ideal op amp, you have an infinite. So the G here, the open loop gain is infinity. Okay, it can handle that. Uh, this is infinity input impedance. Okay, so you, your V out could be a maximum of, of zero. Uh, there's not going to be a common mode rejection ratio. Uh, there's not going to be power supply reject ratio. Okay, there's not going to be offset voltages. There's not going to be any output impedance. There's not going to be any noise. And there's no current that goes in here or out here or in here and out here. And the key thing is, is that this is not actual, but it's actually really close. So the key thing I want you to remember, there are two golden rules. On the input, V plus and V minus, they're equal because there's no current here. Okay. Then the other thing is, is that since there's no current here, that's how we're going to solve the problems. So if I look at a comparator here, okay, where I put a V in here and I ground this out and V out, what that will mean is, is that the V out will go to the maximum output voltage, okay, if I put any voltage right there, okay? And if I put a negative voltage there, okay, what's going to do is that will give me the maximum negative output voltage, okay? And so this is uh, um, this is not used very often, but it could be used if you wanted to have something that would compare this voltage versus that voltage. This is this is probably the most common use is an inverting amplifier where we have an input resistance, and then we have a feedback here with a forward forward feedback. And what you'll find is that the gain here is equal to minus RF divided by RN. So if I put a one mega ohm resistor here and a one ohm resistor here, you will get a minus a million gain. Now minus a million, you might not be able to do, but minus 10,000, you can probably do in real life. The second most common is the non-inverting amplifier. Okay, now the non-inverting amplifier gives you large amplification, okay, again, up near the source voltages. But what you do here is that now VN goes in here and the feedback is now on the other side. You have R1 
R2. Now, what you'll find out here is that the gain is equal to 1 plus R2 divided by R1. So again, if I did a 1 mega ohm res resistor here and a 1 ohm resistor here, I could have a million and one gain, okay? Really high gain, but it's positive. So the other one was negative, this one's positive. If it's a more complex op-amp circuit, simplify it by redrawing it, make it easier to see. Combining resistors, just like we had done before. Use the same circuit analysis tools as KVLs, KCLs, voltage current, but never ever use a KCL at the output. Use the golden rules of an op-amp. But I will tell you, if you can figure out if something looks like a non-inverting amplifier or an inverting amplifier, they're usually going to be combinations of those two. Okay? So if I look at this one here, okay, this looks very, very much like if we go back over here, it looks very much like an inverting amplifier. OK, but it is a little bit different. So what ends up happening is, is that the voltage here is zero. That's saying it goes to ground. So the voltage here is zero. So the current coming in here across R1 is equal to Vs minus zero divided by one kilo. That gives us that current. Well, that current by KCL comes in here. It has to go that way. So that same current goes this way. Well, now that current is going to give me a voltage here. Okay. Well, now I can figure out what that current is coming here. So if I know the current here and I know the current there, I know what the current is here using a KCL right there. And once I know the current there, I know the voltage. Well, now I can go zero plus this voltage plus that voltage, and that'll be my output voltage. And what ends up happening is that after doing all of that, it comes out to about negative 20, okay? That's what I calculated. Now, here's the really cool part about that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, because it looks a lot like an inverting amplifier, so I should expect it to be minus here. Okay, now, I look at this puppy, okay? Now, this is another one that's at first glance looks really complex, but let's look at this part. This part right here looks very much like a non-inverting amplifier, okay? This output's gonna be 41 times that. Now, if I've got this voltage here and this voltage here, and remember, no current can go here, so the, so the, so the current's gotta go around here. Well, guess what? I can real easily figure out this voltage right here because this right here is a voltage divider, okay? And what, so what will end up happening is that I notice real fast that it's a non-inverting amplifier, okay? And then as you come down to it, it ends up being 13.67 times 2VA plus VB, okay? Remember how to argue an illegal question. Okay, always make sure that you look back at the rules first. And always make sure you're updating your binder. So with that, I will come back and I'll ask the team, do we have any questions? Mr. Dazi, are you back? Okay, we're going to talk about RC circuits. Now, the next three topics are all Division C. So if we, do we have any Division B people here? Okay, so with Division B people, let's just talk about it real fast. We're going to talk about RC circuits. 
And so what an RC, you know, we talked about diodes before and ideal diodes and LEDs and operational amplifiers, ideal amplifiers. So let's talk about a capacitor. A capacitor stores electrical energy between two plates normally in some sort of dielectric material. Okay. The unit of capacitance is a farad. And just remember the charge is equal to the capacitance times the voltage. Okay. Here are sort of the diagrams you have. And quite often when we look at a capacitor, you'll see that all the charges are on one plate and they're matched by the opposite charges on the other way. And another way you'll see it is quite often is that there's a flat plate here with some sort of small distance here and a big area here. Okay. Now, when this thing is fully charged, what ends up happening is that you hit an equilibrium where no current flows. It reaches a maximum voltage. When it's fully discharged, there's no voltage here, and the current actually keeps flowing until that charge hits that equilibrium. So, if I wanted to calculate the capacitance, it's equal to epsilon times the area divided by the distance. So the smaller the distance, the bigger the area, the more capacitance. And I can also change the epsilon. Okay, the epsilon is the dielectric permittivity of the material. Okay, air has got, uh, or, or free space, you know, vacuum has got 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. Okay, all other materials are going to be higher than that. Air is only slightly higher. So air acts a lot like a vacuum. OK, now you will be able to find all these dielectric uh, items and you need to have a couple tables because if they say, well, what if they use glass? What if they use ceramic, etc.? OK. Now, an RC circuit basically is going to be in two modes. It's either going to be charging the capacitor or it's going to be discharging the capacitor. It, and then and then they'll either charge it to fully charged and then they'll discharge it or they'll have it discharged and they'll be charging, okay? The time constant is equal to RC, where the resistance is when you look from the capacitor, what type of resistance is it facing when it's discharging its current, okay? Or when it's being charged, okay? So, now there's usually gonna be a switch and they will say at some time equals zero and then they'll say it'll either been discharged for a long time or charged for a long time. It, generally speaking, it takes about 60, it, the time constant is about the time it takes to charge a capacitor to about 63% of its maximum value or about the time it takes to discharge a capacitor to 37% of its original value. And so I know you guys have already figured out it actually discharges twice as fast as it charges up, okay? Now, a lot of people say this reminds them a lot of a battery, and, it's, and, it, and there is some truth to that, okay? So think about this. If the switch is set to B for a very long time, it will discharge the capacitor until VC is equal to zero and no current's flowing. If the switch is set to A for a very long time, VC is going to be charged, okay, okay, and eventually this current going through here goes to zero, so therefore the voltage here is v, VC is going to be equal to VB, okay? So just keep in mind that this is how pretty much all of the RC circuit problems go, okay? Now, generally speaking, uh, this is the reason why it is not used, if you will, in B division. Here is the equation for how the charge increases as a function of time, okay? So keep in mind it's one minus E to the minus T divided by RC, okay? The common solution method is find your start condition, determine the impact of the charges at T equals zero, combine capacitors if needed, and remember, Capacitors combine opposite of resistors. So those capacitors which are in parallel actually add up together, and those that were in series actually um, uh, are, are less. And this sort of makes sense when you think about when you put them in parallel, the area uh, continues to grow. 
Okay. And so there's a ton of really good practice problems here. Like you'll see in this particular case, when this thing is fully charged, there's no current going here and it just turns into a voltage divider. So the initial fully charged voltage will be whatever the voltage division, whatever VR1 is equal to is equal to VC. Okay. This is also another very common one. Okay. Where basically when it's fully charged, okay, the switch has been closed for a very long time. So it's fully charged. And so what will end up happening is, is that you've got, there's no current flowing here. And so it's going to actually act like a voltage divider. Okay. And you will have, you know, it'll do um, two to one here. And, uh, and so you, what you need to do is that you do two to one here. And so there's more voltage here. So there's less voltage here. So this is like going to be like four volts here. Okay. And that's going to be like eight volts there. And then it's one to one to nine. Okay. So what that means is there's only going to be 1.2. So you're going to have 10.8 and four here. So 10 minus 0.8 minus four is equal to 6.8 volts is where we're going to start at. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right, Mr. Dassey is back. I had already switched over to Division C. Did you have any questions, Mr. Dassey? While capacitance is part of Division B, understanding how capacitance works, um, knowing how to do an RC time circuit is not part of uh, Division C or Division B. Did you have any other questions, Mr. Dassey? Have you been able to um, compete yet? Have you competed, Mr. Dazzy? Let's see, you don't have any questions. Okay. Have you done any practice tests that you've been able to gather either from previous years or off of Sayali? Not a problem. Take all the time you need, but just keep practicing. And believe it or not, you'll get better and better. Remember, one of the biggest test taking strategies I can give you, solve all the easy problems first, but accurately. Make sure you get all the easy points. Okay. Then get all the ones that are going to take you a little time, but you really know how to do them. Solve all those. You don't want to miss any of the easy problems. Okay. Don't worry about time. Everybody goes different speeds. I was a really fast test taker. I was super uh, inaccurate. In other words, I made lots of stupid mistakes. So what usually would happen is that when I would do tests like this, uh, we, I didn't do Science Olympia, but we did a different competition. that was very similar. They would put me with a friend of mine who was much slower, but much more accurate. And so he would check my work on things that I messed up on a lot. And between the two of us, we got to answer all the questions and we tended to be pretty accurate and we placed pretty well. So do not worry about finishing on time. Is there any area you want me to cover then today? Mr. Dassey, I think you're our only person. Not really? Well, then listen, we'll have another one next week. Uh, when is your next, uh, when's your first uh, invitational or regional? Mm -hmm. 
Not a problem. Just remember, practice a little bit more each week. And that test that took too long, try to take it again. Now that you've updated your, your binder and you've studied your material a little more, take the same test and see if it takes less time. And if you're constantly missing the same types of problems, that's the type of stuff you need to put in your binder, okay? Best of luck to you, Mr. Dazzy, and every, anyone else who's watching the video. Please feel free to send me emails at geaux15 at hotmail.com with any questions you may have. Make sure if you have any questions about the rules, you post them on sonic or sonc.org in the FAQs. And uh, best of luck to everyone. Take care.